Hello. My name is Ron Miscavige, and this is Life After Scientology, and welcome to this episode. Uh, what I want to do this morning is just for the listeners who started listening to the show maybe a month ago or two months or six months ago, you know, people who weren't with us in the very beginning might not know much about me. So just let me give you a very short synopsis of my experience with the subject I'll be talking about, which is abuses of the Church of Scientology and other cults, but primarily Scientology. Now, <clears throat> I was a member of the Church of Scientology for 42 years. I was on staff in the Sea Organization for 26 and a half years. And in the summer, well, actually in the fall, March 25th, 2012, my wife and I escaped. It became intolerable, and we decided we we're going to leave, and it was young. following year, two private investigators were caught who had been following me, getting paid $10,000 a week by the Church of Scientology to report on my every doing. Prior to that, about three months after I left the church in 2012, my both daughters, Lori and Denise, their children, in other words, my grandchildren and all my great-grandchildren, were ordered to disconnect from me. In other words, I lost my family by being a member of the Church of Scientology and disagreeing with the way I was being treated and the way staff was being treated when I was in the Sea Organization. I tried to get back in communication with my daughters and it was made impossible by, well, they were so sold and brainwashed that they didn't want to have anything to do with me anymore. Now, whether that was only because of the church's order or because of their own private decision, I will maybe never know. But when that happened, I thought, I got to do something about this because there are many people like myself who have lost their families and just they're at a standstill as to what to do. So that's why I started this podcast. This was started in February of earlier this year. And it's designed so that if you try to leave or you left or you disagreed with the church and you lost your family or you have a story of any abuse like that, you can call me or my manager and put in a bid to be on the show. And if you're on the show, you're allowed to tell your whole story without me editing it, without throwing you under the bus, showing you respect and get this story out to in any way we can help people to come to their senses and realize if they get hooked up with this church, it's a one-way street to disaster and heartbreak. We have no sponsor. Nobody sponsors this. We do it on our own dime, and that's why we have a system called Patreon, where you can contribute to the ongoingness of this show by contributing $2, $5, $100 a month, whatever you'd like. Just go onto my website, therealronmiscavige.com, and you'll be able to become a Patreon, and that's how you can contribute and... Uh, help with our endeavor to reform. Well, I don't know if we'll ever reform them. Hopefully we can get people, enough people to realize that just don't go near it. That, that's your best uh, defense against getting involved in something like, like I was where I lost my family. So now, so much for that. I hope you feel a little briefed on who I am. And by the way, I did write a book in 2016, May 6th, it came out. It's called Ruthless. Here it is right here. I'm pointing to it with my finger. And on May 6th, 2016, it came out, and it was number one on the New York Times bestseller list for nonfiction. This book tells the whole story in detail, what I just briefly mentioned to you over a few minutes. Okay? So we're getting some business out of the way here. Now, we have two new Patreons, and one is uh, Jordan... I'm going to murder, I hope I don't murder this last name, Onek. And that was for $2. And Jordan, thank you very much. It's very much appreciated. And then also Marilyn Wilson, and that's for $5. Marilyn, thank you very much. And again, very much appreciated. Thank you. So now in line with this, next week, we're going to have something a little bit different. 
what we're going to do is we'll send out a link to all the Patreons. So you'll get this link, and the first 10 who get hooked up or download it will be on the show with me, and we'll have 10 Patreons, and we'll have a private discussion with me and those 10 who are able to get on the show. And I look very much forward to speaking to you, and you'll be able to be on it for an hour with me and ask, ask me questions, and we'll go back and forth on it. Okay, so I look forward to it. So uh, that's what's up for next week. But for now, <coughs> I have a guest. <clears throat> excuse me, a person I've known for decades. And this is a person who's walked the walk. This is not somebody who was a bystander and heard about it or read some book. This person was on staff for many years, worked herself up into one of the top technical persons in the Church of Scientology, worked right with L. Ron Hubbard. And right now, we're going to go over a few things regarding cults. But... Karen, Karen's son, Alexander, was a part of the church, died needlessly, totally unnecessarily, whereas a common antibiotic could have saved his life. She lived through this in the church, in their benevolent evil, and I made a goddamn phrase for you, refused to even let her kiss her son goodbye. So that's a story that's been told on this program, but I wanted you to know that's the background of her. And we're going to go over various aspects of cults, Scientology, and also other cults. And you'll see they all have a, some common denominators, and that's what we're going to go into. So without any further words coming out of my mouth, I want to introduce Karen De La Courier. Good morning, Karen, and very much you're very much welcome to the show, honey. Hi, Ron. Welcome to the viewers watching. Thank you. Now, let's kick it off with this. And I have uh, some bullet points here. And uh, let's take these up and just go over them with each other. <clears throat> Number one, one of the most predominant or the strongest holds or traits that a cult will have on you is you have absolute adherence to a guru. Mm -hmm. And in the case of Scientology, it was L. Ron Hubbard, who was the founder of Scientology. And then, of course, when he died, David Miscavige took over, and he is the guru now. Expand on this, little Karen. You know, the absolute power of the top of the food chain occurs in a cult. I was raised in Church of England, an offshoot of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, the services have rituals and Bible lessons and stuff, but there's no authoritative dictator. Just before we started, you mentioned Muriel Def Dufresne? Yeah. All right. Now, let me give you a short little two-minute anecdote on a guru and Muriel. David Miscavige wanted Highway 79 shut down. Ron, explain why he wanted this. <laughs> this well, road. okay, I, I can tell you because I was there. Now, yeah. the base in Hammett, California, or San Jacinto. Either way, it's it's right, right there in that area. Um, there is a road that runs between the property because. The property of the international base lies north of the road and south of the road. So when you're driving along the highway, you're on a road that's separating the base into the south and the north side. On the north side is a music studio, and that music studio was built, and a precaution was made so as not to get the vibrations from the road into the studio, by putting the recording room itself <clears throat> on huge rubber hockey pucks so they take up the vibrations. But more importantly was you'd get noise from the road and the executives on the base lived on the north side and primarily David lived there and he wanted to cut that noise out. <clears throat> so that was an ongoing issue for many years with the port captain, which is the public relations 
person at the at that gold base to get the county to shut the road down and make it a private road so that only we could use it and other people would have to go a different way to get into the town of San Jacinto coming off of Route 60 or Route 10. So that, that was the whole reason behind it, that you wouldn't get noise on the upper side so the executives wouldn't be bothered by the noise. Okay, now I'm going to elongate this little anecdote. First of all, aside from the noise, back in the day, people would escape. They would run onto Highway 79 and hail down a passing car, and it was freedom. One of the main pieces of evidence of how they have a tunnel. You go from, you're not, al <laughs> you're not allowed to step on Highway 79 because you could flee. This is a horror. This, this in base is a place of atrocities, and people... Is Ron and Becky escaped. Ron, you escaped. We, That's we'll, right. get in, we'll get into escape stories. But the noise, yes. Also, ability to get on that. Uh, the wonderful story of David Miscavige's personal secretary, Tanya Castle. She jumped the fence. Stefan was on Highway 79. Boom! Escape. So yeah. escape was a big feature as well. But let me tell you, Ron, you jogged my memory on Muriel. We chatted before the thing. David Miscavige is the guru, the dictator. He can call whether you sleep, whether you eat, whether you're in isolation. This, only a cult leader can do this. So one day after years of trying, Highway 79 is a main artery shutting it down or making it private would block thousands of com commuters. So, <laughs> David Miscavige, in a fury, ordered Muriel and Ken Houghton to stand on Highway 79 from 3 o'clock in the morning till breakfast at 8, five hours, can be pretty cold. Ooh, in winter months, this is inland. This is desert. They had to stand on Highway 79 five hours a day to listen to the sound of the trucks that went by that disturbed David Miscavige's sleep. And this went on week <coughs> after week, month after month. The, the sleep deprivation, they weren't allowed to then make up sleep time. They got this much sleep, and at 3 in the morning till 8 breakfast, they had to stand, just stand, and listen to the sound of the trucks going by. Where is the kindness? Where is the humanity? Scientology craves religious recognition. We're a church, church, First Amendment, First Amendment. Where is the humanity in having two Sea Org members stand in the bitter cold five hours a day to listen to trucks going by? Well, you know how that ended. Ken was thrown then in the RPF subsequently for not closing down where he stayed for several years. Did you want to say something, Ron? Well, I was going to tell you, you, you ask, where is the humanity? So I'm going to give this to our listeners and the viewers. I'm going to show you where the humanity is, and I'm going to show you where the humanity is. Okay? Good. Great. Here's what I want all of you to do. Everybody who's watching, listen to me. Close your eyes right now. What do you see? There's the humanity. It doesn't exist. Open your eyes. Not there, Karen? Um, yeah. Not only is there no humanity, there yeah. is brutality. There is atrocity. There is domination. See, David Miscavige could let people stand on Highway 79 from the middle of the night till breakfast for several hours for months because he had the power. Yeah. And when you said expand on a guru, 
the the dictator in a cult has supreme power, absolute power. Yeah. He he can order what he wants. And that that is very true because let's face it, all of the cults have that. They have all have a guru. Like the Moonies had one. Uh, the Jonestown people who went down to Guyana to commit suicide, they had the guru. And uh, this is witness? a common trait. Pardon me? Jehovah's Witness. Yeah. It, they, they, they all have that guru who has, it's like an intermediary between the people who follow him and a deity or a an answer to your travails on earth, maybe like your a good eternity. In other words, that person lies between you and what you desire most, which would be in whatever that is. It's either eternal life or going to heaven instead of going to hell. He acts as an intermediary. And I think that's the best way to describe this guru. He's not the end all, but he's the one that tells you how you can reach, uh, reach your fondest goal. Do you agree with that, Karen? Yes, very much so. I was thinking of Tony Alamo. Do you remember that cult that, Tony What's Alamo the cult. There was a guy in Texas who made people make cowboy boots, and they worked eighty hours a week, hundred hours a week, and they made cowboy boots. They sewed the leather. His name was Tony Alamo. I didn't and, know that was a cult. Oh yeah, very much a cult. Because I've heard of those boots. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy, he was ferocious. He beat the children in the cult. He and and. And mothers allowed him because they felt God talked to him. Yeah. There's this illusion <clears throat> that the cult leader has access to a supreme higher being. Yeah. Through this higher being. Look, look at all the, look at the church of LD, FLDS, the offshoot of the Mormons. They literally believe that pedophile that is in jail now was the most, was in touch with God. Yeah. That God was giving him orders. And no matter how heinous the way he acted out, God was telling him to do it. Yeah. So all critical thinking is lost. Once you believe talk about fake news once you believe the fake fakeness of a brutal brutal leader one other thing ron tell me if you agree with me it seems like the most vicious the most physically uh able to just completely dominate seems to bubble up and rise to be the leader i, yeah. I take it out of religion take it out of religion you, yeah. You're going to have to turn your voice up on your end because I'm having a hard, very hard time hearing you, honey. Oh, so, okay. Uh, sure shot, thing. You can do it here. Wait, sure my, my producer says he can do it. Just say something. Um, I just I just turned up. Is that better? Or? That, that's perfect, yeah. Okay, okay now, give me that question again because I only got part of it. Ron, I was saying that let's take it out of religion for one second. Isn't it true? that the most frightening, the most vicious, the most uh, physically able to just assault and kill inevitably rises to the top. Look at Hitler, Mussolini, uh, you know, Saddam Hussein or Gaddafi or any, if you give me any current leader, the one who's able to kill or be physically violent seems to rise up to be top dog. No, that, that is true. But there's another aspect of this that maybe you haven't thought about. They receive the most publicity. What mm -hmm. they do is more broadly known than if you get somebody who's a good person who leads a country or a group through a period of prosperity. You hardly hear about that at all. Yeah. You see that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that's a fact. Now, listen, Lord Acton, and I brought up his name many times in his program, said, <clears throat> power tends to corrupt. 
absolute power corrupts absolutely and powerful men and I'm paraphrasing this last one are almost always bad men he said this in the 19 in the 1800s and boy if that isn't a true statement that's observably true I don't know of any because you look at any of these guys once they get that power they use it in a bad way do you see that I do, but all right, let's discuss this. Um, you've got to have some evil in your soul. And then the power. Winston Churchill had supreme power. He didn't commit yeah. evil. But Al Capone, who killed, who <laughs> whacked 78 <Yeah>. people, <clears throat> he rose to the top in Chicago because he was willing to whack you if you looked at him the wrong way. Yeah. So it wasn't he he then became he then became the mobster of Chicago, but it wasn't just that power floats you into being an evil being. You've no. got to have that evil in your soul. There have Listen. been very good statesmen that had a lot of power, but they weren't evil. No, I, I agree with you because look at if you were to plant an oak tree acorn in the ground and water it, you're not going to get a pine tree. Right. <laughs> so what you nourish and encourage is what you're going to get. Yeah. And inherent in these people is within their own DNA, yeah. that evil purpose to rule it over people and uh, crush them and use them to their own advantage. I do agree. I'm, yeah. Maybe I should have said that as part of it, but this is, this is something that, uh, that happens. And, you might not be able to spot it, just like you wouldn't be able to spot it in a lion cub, that that lion cub, when it gets to be an adult, could just chew your head off and don't even care that he did it. There's no conscience there. And uh, you don't see it as the little budding sapling of a tree. But soon enough, you're going to see, hey, wait a minute, I'm getting a, an oak tree. Well, that was that was built into that person to begin with. So we, we don't have a disagreement. I just failed to mention that. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, no. I get you completely. Yeah. And once you get the power and you already have malevolence, if you have a virulent personality, boy, that power. And it's okay. so disheartening. In the, in, in, it's so disheartening. Like we're talking about cults. The, just the dominance to shrink you into a dot, to just yeah. crush you. Scientology crushes the soul. It's those six months I had at in face. God, God Almighty, I, it it was soul destroying day by day oh, by yeah. day. I was oh, yeah. shrunk. You're made to believe that you have no talent. Any of your abilities are nothing. Anything you do is worthless, and everything you do is to destroy the leader the guru and you have to make up the damage and you'll spend your lifetime doing it and never get out of the condition where he says that you're in where you're you're worthless and everything he does is good and everything you do is bad okay we got the top of the totem pole now okay yes but let's look at how this is used as an example in scientology there's an abusive relationships like divorces are encouraged Abortions are ordered. If you're in, let's say, the Religious Technology Center and you fall in love with the person who's in a lower or lower caste org, you <laughs> cannot have a relationship or get married to them. Well, why don't you get into that a little bit? Because you, you were part of that. Well, uh, I mean, with Eber, do you remember? Yeah. Of course you remember. I mean, it's stupid. Yeah. But. yeah. Your son, David Miscavige, the, the leader and supreme dictator of the Church of Scientology, ordered, Mark Headley did a compilation of 184 couples that were ordered to divorce by David Miscavige. The compilation of this list is all over the internet. If you Google David Miscavige ordered divorces, boom, you get the list. Wow. So there's an example of, and they complied. Warren McShane, the, the legal guy there, he divorced his wife of 20 years. Boom. David Miscavige ordered it, gone. 
Guillaume yeah. Lecerve, permanent executive, ED and executive director. He was ordered to divorce Vanessa. Boom, not only did he do it, she was kicked off the base. Yep. So let's look at what is going on here. This is a love only me church, church, cult, cult, cult. Love only me. You are not to love a wife or your child or any family member more than your devotion to the cult of Scientology. Isn't that what it amounts to? Yep, you right. have to be loyal. You you snitch. Sons and daughters write knowledge reports, snitching and ratting out their own parents. Parents snitch on their own children. Everybody reports to the mother church, RTC. So you turn in and betray loved ones because the cult of Scientology demands. It doesn't request. It orders that you do so. No, you're right. In it, the knowledge reports, some of them are ludicrous. I mean, I've had knowledge reports written on me, and I went to the person and says, listen, why didn't you take this up with me if you had a disagreement? Why are you doing this? And I had one girl say, oh, you're making it difficult to write up a knowledge report. I says, I'm making it difficult. What I'm trying to do is re establish a relationship where we can talk to each other. And if you have differences, let's talk them out. But no, you keep your mouth shut and go in your dark little corner and write up a knowledge report. And then this goes to ethics and ethics says, well, there's a knowledge report on you and blah, blah, blah. And you are assumed to be guilty, not innocent. In other words, the person who gets the first report in is the one who wins. It's nothing short of insanity. That's the way it is. And you're exactly right when you're talking about snitching. That That's what goes on. It's a snitching culture. Yeah. And it makes a very unsafe environment because anyone, even your best friend, will rat you out and write up a private. If you just sighed and said, look, I'm not getting enough sleep. I don't agree with the schedule. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> that disaffected enemy blah, blah 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 and then punishment so you live in an in a cult we're looking at cult this is like russia where people would secretly report to the kgb or china where people if you're planning a set when you weren't allowed to have a second child people report to grannies everybody is reporting on each a huge amount of scientology is ethics reports and chits and People ratting out each other. What a... It's... it's and, and everyone's on edge of when they're summoned to ethics, the, the, the morality department, the person who's going to penalize you because somebody snitched on you. That's the life and culture. That's, that's common in a cult. <laughs> well... That is true, and uh, I don't think it only happens in Scientology, but I think the formality of it on how to write a knowledge report is pretty unique to the church. But other cults have the same procedure as this. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. And yeah. you talked about abortions. For a good 25 years, maybe 30 years, you see they're still doing it, but they do it covertly. You in Scientology are ordered to abort a baby if you get pregnant yeah in fact riverside planned parenthood had such a stream of women just bus loads of them that they who engage in abortions planned parenthood is there to to assist a woman who doesn't want a child right but even they got suspicious with the just the sheer quantity and they all had the same story which made Planned Parenthood very suspicious the same story no matter how many pre children they previously had no matter how young they were no matter how much they loved their husband they all wanted bam it was a monolithic response and anyway who 
that started with Hubbard. And the reason abortions were ordered was there was no gynecologist, obstetrician, no baby kind of doctor yeah. on, the sh on the Apollo. And if we were on the high seas, <clears throat> baby presented itself, breach or needed a C-section, what would you do? What would you do? You could yeah. be three days away from a port. So if a person got pregnant on the Apollo, their option was to have the baby, but they would be reassigned to uh, what was called CLO, a FOLO, or a, a, a different land-based Scientology outfit. So the divorce was not forced on the Apollo. You could choose to leave and start a family on a base. Yeah. But the initial thing was, now, they're not on the high seas now. No. Hemet, the, the San Jacinto, you know, this Gilman Hot Springs was 100, 200 miles from the ocean. So there was no reason or excuse of oceanic waves to cause a possible distress in, a, in, in delivery of a birth. Divorce is a cult, fun, excuse me, abortion is a cult, fun, and the church has blood on their hands. They ordered, I've done videos on a guy called Gary Weber, and he was the driver in Clearwater. And twice a week, two busloads, twice a week, the bus was completely full of young girls in their 20s being sent to Planned Parenthood. And this was coerced abortion i'm not getting into the abortion argument of well okay there's a difference between enforced coerced abortion because the guru orders it that's yeah. different than a woman choosing planned parenthood that is a mouthful and that does make the difference right there but that then leads back again to the guru at the top of the totem pole yes. Yes. All of this is ordered down and complied with. Yeah. That's what you got to get across because well, that's what we've got to get across because mm -hmm. it's one thing to have a leader who's benevolent, who's doing good things, and you want to do the things to provide support to him to bring about his programs or reforms. That's one thing. <laughs> and it's another thing to listen to somebody out of fear of some type of retribution where maybe you'd be kicked out or yeah. ostracized by the group or lose your family. Those are two different animals right there. And we're yeah. talking about the one where the guru has the ultimate say over your freedom or your enslavement in his mind or your mind, or you losing your eternity, which if you come right down to it is complete bullshit. Nobody is going to say to you, Okay, where's your past to go into a uh, life forever in eternity? It is, come on, get real, you know. But your your mind can be altered to believe things like this. <laughs> okay, so that that's the abuse of relationships. And then there, there's another point here, and I think we should take it up, Karen. And that's this us versus them mentality. Ron, is it okay if we just do a little more on love, romance, sex? Of course, yeah. Children, just a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, look, um, we're not following a goddamn script, so we can do anything. <laughs> with, you know? yeah, right. <laughs> um, I was wa I was watching a I was watching a show on the Himalayas, those high mountains in the northern India, and there's a spider that survives practically at Mount Everest level. He's this spider is called the Himalayan spider. And in that brutal, freezing 365 days a year, he lives there, but he's top of his food chain. He doesn't have anyone gobbling him up. Nobody takes him on because nobody wants to live in that freezing cold. <clears throat> so he is top of his food chain. And I was looking at this spider. He has eight eyes, sir. <laughs> he's like an alien and he lives there and i was thinking wow top of the food chain the guru nobody takes you on 
No. Nobody will annihilate you. Why? You are the top of the food chain. You've already arrived. Now, there are such things as coups and purges and all that. So, he's top of the food chain. By the way, the Himalayan spider, when he gets hungry, gobbles up his own wife or, 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 or female. He just eats it for food. Wow. So, I was watching all this Shelley. It isn't just that David Miscavige lost his father and daughter-in-law, you, Becky, his brother, Ronnie, fled. He, <laughs> he ordered his wife in a kind of exile. And to me, he was almost copycatting L. Ron Hubbard, because that's what Hubbard did with Mary Sue. Wow. Mary Sue was in exile. She was, she was completely blamed. The finger was pointing for those 1977 raids. And once she did jail time as a felon, she was an outcast. Mm. And she lived there till she died of cancer, cancer of the breast. After all this, Knots auditing by Neville Potter day after day after day for 20 years, 30 years. She got cancer like any other human being, and she died. Wow. That was the wife of the founder, Mary Sue Hubbard. Now we have Shelley. It's been 10 years. You knew Shelley. You were Shelley's father-in-law. Of, of course I do. I mean, I had many conversations with Shelley. Do you have As her, something uh, you can share about Shelley? Father-in-law. Well, <clears throat> not really. I, I can tell you this. As much as I would enjoy, and I actually enjoyed talking to her. She was nice to me. But I never quite had the father, uh, father-in-law's relationship with her like you would, let's say, outside of the cult. Yeah. yeah do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, there was always that does. distance yeah. kept there that I was a staff member. Mm -hmm. And most of our conversations were how to behave properly or maybe better than the average person in the C organization because I was David's father. <clears throat> and, you know, some people think, well, you must have had it cushy because you were his father. That, that's you're dreaming. <laughs> if anything, it was harder because I was held to a higher standard that I had a up upkeep because of him being on yeah. top of the food chain there. Yeah. But uh, with Shelly, yeah, she was she was a nice soul, but so she, our conversations yeah. didn't get into a personal, very much of a personal thing of, as to me being her father-in-law. It was always on that level of the third dynamic, in other words, the group and how I should act. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, th that's a socialist, the, the group, the government, the group is everything, yeah. and you're nothing, you're a dot, you're just a worker bee, you know. Shelly, I, I have some compassion for, because she arrived as a kid on the Apollo, 12, 13 years old, and can you imagine your entire life, all your study, you have never experienced any other life than Hubbard's doctrines, two and a half hours a day study time yeah. and living in a cult. There's Shelley who's lived in a cult morning, noon and night since she was 11 years old. And now David Miscavige exiles her to some mountainous where they keep see, Oh, 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 this is good. You're talking about cults. It's a doomsday cult. Scientology believes there will be a nuclear holocaust. Right. So every word Hubbard has said is in titanium plates buried in the mountain. <laughs> now, why are they doing this? They believe that a tr tremendous nuclear holocaust is going to end it all. Is that not a doomsday cult? No kidding. And when you open up these vaults, you're going to find vital information like if you want to clean a car window, use newspaper. I mean, things like that. Very <laughs> <well>. <laughs>
and they have extorted huge sums of money from their flock to yep. put all this on titanium plates. You know, yep. if there's a, Ron, let's examine this. If there's a nuclear holocaust and people just want water to drink and shelter, they're going to go in and study theory on, nuclear, <laughs> on, on titanium plates? That's what they that's what they're going to do after the, the earth has been made into a billiard ball. <laughs> You're missing a big point here as brilliant as you are, Karen. And I can tell you <laughs> what it is. It's not the clear thought of how they would do this, but it's how good it sounds. Just imagine titanium plates sealed in nitrogen uh, container. <laughs> so it, that sounds fantastic. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. Whether it's true or not, it has nothing to do with reality. But that's what sounds good, and that's what sells it. And that's where you get people throwing tens of hundreds of thousands of dollars into the preservation of this technology. But you're right. You want to drink a water. You want something to eat. God damn it. What are you going to do with these titanium? Do you have a, a DVD player or a CD player? Do <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Well, of course you do. Well, you build infrastructure. You have no infrastructure. You're certainly not going to study what somebody put on titanium. Plate. Anyway, neither here nor there. The thing is that the guru can order that. Yeah. The guru can spend the money. The cult of Scientology has no financial transparency at all. Millions are raised. Where does the money go? There's something called Charity Guide where many nonprofits absolutely display accounting of where the money went. David Miscavige can sign any check. Look how he paid private investigators to stalk and follow you. $10,000 a week. Yeah. But, but he doesn't need permission. He can no. write a check. And that's another quality of a cult. The guru has total, utter financial control. You're with right. No, with no transparency. He doesn't have to show anything. He doesn't, never has to produce any evidence. And all these people that give millions, they never ask, how is my money being spent? Yeah. Isn't it well, natural you, to you, want you gotta to give them? You've got to give them credit for this. This is one of the most clever scams ever, maybe in the history of this planet. I mean, it's, it's brilliant. The, the nefarious uh, forms they take on in order to pull this off. I mean, look, look at the IAS. It was started for a totally different reason that it has today. Oh, boy. It was used to hide money offshore. Yes. And now the it's IAS. supposedly, uh, it's supposedly money to in, in case we have a, a war with somebody. Yeah, it's bullshit. Come on. <laughs> the IAS, International Association of Scientologists, the ultimate scam. They've yeah. got some nebulous promises of we'll give make you we'll make a better world. We'll make a better world for your grandchildren, for your great grandchildren. This is this is all totally utter nonsense. The IAS has been around since the nineteen eighties. The world is not safer. There are more IUD bombers, there's ISIS, there's terrorist groups, there's the world is certainly not safer because of the IAS. No. Nope. The IAS is a money extortion racket. Yeah. Racket. Absolute racket. Your money goes into it like the ad on the Roach Motel. You can get in, but you can't get out. That money is one way in, and they talk about giving grants for various things, like the volunteer ministers. The volunteer ministers pay their own way. They don't even get a grant, yet the church continually contact, collects money for that, for the volunteer ministers to say they're going to give these grants out. They don't just don't do it. The IES is the same way. It's the same motor, modus operandi. And who determines it to be that way? The guru. You got it. <laughs> so it all, it all leads back. All, leads ro lead to, all roads lead to Rome. You know, Ron, yeah. If you want to change it, if you change the guru, 
it would change in an instant. You know, Ron, people wonder, how do they get so much money? How are they always increasing their real estate portfolio? How are they doing it? <laughs> I will tell you, in the Los Angeles area, there are about 300 people who've declared bankruptcy because the cult has drained them. I, I'm talking about 300 people in the last year or two, not forever. 300 people of the cult of Scientology had to declare bankruptcy and try to get off the hook on their debts because of cult money extortion. Mm. Isn't that something? No, oh, it, it's fabulous. It's just, yet people, they have to bring up their confront on something like this to actually believe it, it's happening because most people aren't that way. So they have a hard time thinking, well, how could somebody be that way? Like, there's no way I would make my daughters stop talking to each other. I just couldn't do it. So then you think, well, how could somebody do that? You're talking to about a different animal when you're talking about a guru who's a head of a cult. There's no conscience there. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. No conscience at all. Now, part of this was, there's another trait here I want to bring up. And there's no tolerance for questioning of any kind. Right. So that, that's a one-way communication cycle. It goes out, but you can't voice any disagreement up or your dog meat. You'll oh. be disconnected. You'll be thrown out. You'll lose your family. Yeah. Yeah. Very much so. Um, one of David Miscavige's previous chefs, Lana, Lana Mitchell, she uh, wrote that <coughs> right back then in the 90s, his food budget was... $2,000 a week. And I got to say, your son, David Miscavige, lives like a rock star. Oh, yeah. his personal staff. He's waited on. He eats the most exquisite food. He has, there are reports from Free Winds, fresh fruit daily. With, it's, it can be discarded if he didn't arrive, but his he's pampered, and he lives like a Saudi king. He yeah. lives like a wealthy Saudi king. Now, what you just said, if you dare to voice and say, look, we're getting $50, $25 for 80 hours slaving a week. And <laughs> can you imagine if you tried to say you're living like a rock star and we are, we don't even have enough to buy toiletries. Can you imagine what would happen if you did if you did to think that because <laughs> never mind voice it yeah you'd go on the rpf can you explain for your global audience rpf yeah i can well, but go ahead you yeah, okay well the rpf is, well, is the rehabilitation project force and nothing could be further than the truth when they call it a rehabilitation force what it is is a denigration to the ultimate. In other words, you go on that and you soon realize that unless you cough up with sins that are acceptable to the person who's doing the interrogation, if you don't cough up with these, you could be on that RPF for the rest of your life. So it goes from confessing to things that you did that, let's face it, in, in a, a real world, in the real world at large, if you said to somebody, hey, listen, you know, I you had uh, some change on the counter and I took a quarter. That's no big deal. It'd be the end of it. That you'd go in, in interrogation and go back to your original evil purpose on the whole track. In other words, everything that you've done bad is magnified when you're on the RPF. And unless you come up with some real doozies, you ain't getting off of it, must Buster. So a person will, after a while, start making up things that he feels will get him off this. And I'm not making this up. I've had people who were on the RPF tell me this. So that is a way to break a person. In other words, start molding his mind 
totally in the direction that you want it to be. Uh, accept everything the guru says. Don't question it. Accept the personal abuse of. Uh, if you ever spoke out badly enough, you'd be kicked out of the church and your whole family would be disconnected from you, just like I did, just by my mere escaping. When I escaped, I had no intention of going to the media. I was just going to go out and get a job and live my life in uh, better circumstances than I was being exposed to right there. They made me an enemy. Yeah. They made me. They, they took my family away from me. Now, listen, I'm talking about two daughters, all my grandchildren and my great grandchildren, children who I'm, I've never met them. Yeah, Jenna and her two lovely children, uh, Winnie and Archie, and, and of course, my son, Ronnie. I still am in communication with them. But the rest of my relations, they're gone. Yeah. And this was my punishment for speaking out. Yet I wasn't going to do anything. Yeah. That is what led me to write this book. And that is what led me to have this program where yeah. people came on and voice their concerns about uh, a ruthless, suppressive group like this existing and nobody in the government having the balls to say, yeah. hey, hang on a second. You're not a goddamn church. Yeah. You, you know, your, your, your tax exemption is done. Nobody, not one politician. Let, let me just say that. Yeah. It, it doesn't speak a lot for the people who were in the government. And now there, there's a lot of good guys. There's a lot of fine people, but not for one person to think, hey, wait a minute. This Ronnie, show. I want to tell you something. Yeah. The, the, the government is listening. The government is watch well i hope I'm they not going are. To say i anymore, hope they are because if you have any balls how about giving us a hand down here in the trenches because that's <laughs> what we are you got a marine veteran coming on and has his own podcast on his own dime he's doing it and trying to help people to be aware don't get involved if you can help uh, thank you from the bottom of my heart and i'll tell you what with the biggest help you could be is get them to lose their tax exemption knock off this disconnection from families you'll everybody start talking to each other and you do a, a wonderful thing for a lot of people there's my pitch to the government if you're listening and <laughs> not, not listening i just said to myself and my listeners who you who are listening i appreciate it very much i appreciate it from the bottom of my heart because if you're going to get more people to subscribe to this and get enlightened that's that's what i want more than anything look i'm a musician i still play music Truthfully, I enjoy this more than anything I do because I think I'm doing something that's beneficial to a lot of people. And I hope I'm not pipe dreaming on that. I hope it I hope this is what's happening. Mm -hmm. And guests like Karen, wonderful. Go well, on, Karen. Uh, I, I first of all I, I, I thought of seven bullet points on on a cult. So I hope <laughs> I can send those to you and we can re I know we're wrapping into the towards the end but may i just say may i just say very very much in two minutes the Go rpf ahead. is the dark secret place of the cult of scientology you're not allowed to ever walk you have to run you eat all of a twist slop cold leftovers you're sleep deprived you get one hour less sleep than if you weren't in the rpf you're cut off from civilization. You're cut off from the outside world. You're not allowed to even talk to anyone outside the RPF. If your husband or wife goes into the RPF, that's it. No relationship. You, you can't even talk, leave alone meet. So it's an isolation prison camp. But worse than that, it's a thought reform. You are there to actually have realizations that management is all good and wonderful and the way they do it is something called the truth rundown i'm very aware of time i know we're nearly done maybe i can maybe no, we go can ahead do that on part two huh go okay. ahead this okay. is this is interesting i'd like you to end with okay. it as a matter of fact the truth rundown is to get you to look at your evil you, 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 you're bad. You have evil purposes. You have evil, evil, evil. So let's flush out this evil. So what they do is they go through every single report on you, where you may have been a little critical, where you may have protested 
such treatment. And then they go, remember when you said you weren't getting enough sleep? Da, 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 da. What crime did you commit before you had that thought? And you're pounded and you're pounded and you're pounded to get your evil. And this is done every day, five hours a day. You are made to look at what a sinful, evil, atrocious piece of worthless scum you are. And after you've had this five hours a day, month after month, you suddenly go, oh, I'm the evil one. David Miscavige and they're all good guys. And once you can voice that, you can come out of this prison regime. You're not allowed. Yeah. And not only that, then you have to physically voice that to all of the RPM. You have to not only say it in your confessional, you have to announce to the world how deluded you were, how, how crazy you were to be critical of this wonderful thing called Scientology. All right, I know, I know it's time. But I got seven more bullet points. Can I send them to you? <laughs> yeah, send them, but let's have another show because we're kind of running out of time right now. But I got to tell you, Karen, that I think this is going to help a lot of people. I hope it does because these are points that if you have in mind and you start getting involved, not only in the Church of Scientology, but any particular type of movement or maybe a meeting you'd have with somebody who starts talking this way, Examine what are the statistics of this person. What do they actually produce in life? Are they talking about, like in Scientology, that you will achieve exterior with full perception? Go and talk to some people who supposedly have reached that level and see if they have. And if they tap dance around or try to avoid it, then you know that that's uh, a lie. As a matter of fact, I was involved in the church for 42 years. I never met one person who achieved that. Uh, I have my producer catching my eye. So stay with this, Karen. Go on, Sean. We have uh, one super chat from Alice Lynch. She said, just wanted to send my love to Karen, Jawdeck, and MM. So that was $2 for you. She's saying she loves you guys. So. And, and what's your name? Alice Lynch. Allison. Yeah. Alice. Not Alice Lynn. Alice Lynch. Alice Lynch, okay. Yeah, your honorary, your I got these headphones yeah. on and I can hardly hear you. Alice Lynch, thank you very much. And this is coming to the end of it, so just let me mention Patreon again because it is the thing that gives us our independence. We don't have a sponsor, so I have nobody telling me what I can or cannot say or who I can have on or can't have on. And originally I started the program because I was on 2020. Uh, when my book first came out, because it was a number one. Well, actually, maybe that helped become a number one. Sorry. I was interviewed for over eight hours, and maybe I had 18 minutes on the show. So if you come on this show with your story, you will be allowed to tell your story. And if we can't get it all done in one program, I'll have you back to make sure you, you get your story told. I'm not going to treat you like a, a dog or denigrate you. I'll treat you with respect. And you have an opportunity to air your your fight that took place with the Church of Scientology. So that's an open invitation of anybody out there who has a story to tell. Meanwhile, <clears throat> what helps, though, is those of you who have become Patreons, because instantly you turn from a one who spectates or watches it into a participant. And I can tell you this, you'll feel better because you know you're doing some good toward furthering the cause that we have, which is to hopefully get the church the church's tax exemption taken away. But meanwhile, anybody who watches this is going to get enlightened and they wouldn't go into a church and join it. Okay, I'm, I'm out of words for right now. This is a great program, though, Karen. I appreciate your input. And look, at, we're, we're going to get you back. And we have this escape story that we didn't even oh, get yeah. into. But I, I don't want to get into it because we don't have enough time to do it justice. Yeah. Yeah. To me, the the story we were going to tell you, I won't even tell you the person's name. It'll be up in the next show. How about that? Yeah. Is That's a good horrible. one. Oh. It's beyond your imagination 
what happened to this individual. That you don't want to miss. So watch our announcements that Sean puts out as to when you're going to be on or who's going to be on the next show. Meanwhile, Karen, thank you very much for coming on. Bye, Ron. Bye, Sean. I, I appreciate it, honey. And uh, for all of you who are out there watching me, I am Ron Miscavige. This is Life After Scientology. See you on the next episode.